Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Today's episode is sponsored by Athletic Greens. So make sure you go to athleticgreens.com slash insane to get your free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Enjoy the episode. Hi, I'm Nia and I got abused at a psych ward. For context, I guess the best place to start would be my childhood, (laughs) like where my family's from. My parents both immigrants from Jamaica, so don't know the mu- the most about mental health. I'd struggled with like mental health stuff since like eighth grade, and mostly my symptoms were depression and anxiety. So it kind of came to a peak um, at a point because like my family wasn't super aware of like mental health in that sense. And sophomore year, I got admitted like three times within three months in like 2015, and it was like a big reckoning. Um, I got admitted mostly for like suicidal ideation, no attempts, but just like the vibes were off. I wasn't feeling it. (laughs) So was that your parents' choice to send you? No. The first time I actually went to just like a physical, like a checkup Mm -hmm. and my doctor was like, how's your mental health? And my mom was like, she's been depressed. And I was like, no, like it's really bad. Like I'm trying to not do this anymore. And my doctor was like, oh, this is a medical emergency. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the ER and I got admitted for the first time. Okay. And then the second and third times were basically me being back and forth from a partial program. So I was kind of like out of school for three months doing Mm -hmm. this half therapy, half school thing. And like, it was not a great program. So like I would go back and forth between there and the hospital. Yeah. But once I graduated out of that, went back to school, was on like medication, I was good, Mm -hmm. you know, especially because now my family kind of understood my situation more, my symptoms, mental health, mental health practices, the industry. Yeah. Um, Things were good. You know, I graduated high school, gone to college, you know, slayed like I did. I moved to New York. It was all very cool. And I kind of felt like, you know, things things happen but my mental health was pretty stable from Mm -hmm. like 2016 to 2021 you know so i didn't see this coming (laughs) i definitely didn't see this coming in 2021 i had like gone through a breakup actually like two breakups Mm -hmm. and it was rough i was kind of reckoning with my identity and what kind of person i am i guess which is normal yeah, I don't know. Happens to the best of us. Fun 20s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it all came to a head, and I was just really suicidal again. Mm-hmm. Like, it was bad. Were you still on medicines at this point? No. No? Okay. Like, I got off meds, honestly, in, like, 2017. Like, I'd just been raw Because you were just it. doing better. I was just doing okay. better, yeah. I think I... Honestly, I think my family's support just changed a lot of things, and, mm-hmm. like, I was in therapy. Yeah, I started 2022 in a bad place and I knew that like I'd been in that place before so I called my mom and I was like I need to come home and I need to go to the hospital she took me and I went and this was also mind you like back in the day I was in the child units so like different ball game right this was my first time in the adult unit but in New Jersey and it was fine you know it didn't really help but I think a lot of people kind of have this idea that like the psych is where you go and you just need a little break, you know, yeah. <laughs> which wasn't my mentality, but it kind of was. So it was nice, you know, and I, I really want to accentuate and emphasize like the different circumstances at this hospital in Jersey where it was like mostly like white patients who were on a, in the process of like weaning off of like drug, like substances. Mm-hmm. So it was chill vibes. Everyone was kind of slumped, but, you know, we listened to music. We did art therapy. It's the psych ward. Yeah. So how long were you there during that stay? Six days, me five okay. days. Yeah. And I convinced my mom, like, I'm chill. I'm, I want to go back to the city. I'm going to get back into it. And I did. Which was not the, was not the good choice to make. But I went back and I had just, like, one of the worst weeks. <laughs> Terrible week. Um, like, and by the end of it, like, there was, like, a party. And I was, like... I, it was at my apartment. I had a party in my apartment. I couldn't get out of bed. And, like, my friends were mad at me because I couldn't get out of bed. And then they ghosted me after. And I was like, why? And I was just, like, FaceTime everyone, like, what's going on? Because I was, like, I was just in the hospital and everyone knew. So I was like, mm-hmm. why? Is this, what's going on? Um, it was some petty stuff. I tried to self-buy. <laughs> it was not. I don't remember much of it. 
the ambulance came, took me to a hospital called Woodhull Hospital. Was this in New York? This was in New York. Okay. This hospital is in Bushwick, um, which was the area slated for where I was living. And this is all a week after you just got out. Yeah. Okay. Before this, you were in New Jersey, in hospital in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Okay. Back in New York. Right. Bad week. Now you're going, the ambulance comes, you're going to a hospital in, in Bushwick. Okay. Brooklyn. Got it. So I don't, and I was there for seven, seven, eight days. The first day, super blurry. I was in the like ER, wherever they were trying to figure out if they should admit me or not. And mm-hmm. then I don't know what pushed them or pulled them in either direction. I don't remember the conversations I had, probably based on nothing, based mm-hmm. on what I know about this hospital, but I did get admitted. Yeah. Instantly, I was very much aware of the contrast between mm-hmm. these two hospitals that I'd stayed in. Yeah. Not only demographically, but also like just qualitatively you know care wise Mm -hmm. attentive wise like it was not something was off immediately when i got on the unit uh and this unit is like it's just a square it's just like a little box four little hallways with a pathetic little if i can even call it a garden you know Mm -hmm. like there's not sun really you can't there's no windows really and like i had a view of the parking lot which was awesome um and like the first few days I was really on my righteous stuff because I, you know, I'm a Libra. I was mm-hmm. like, this is, this isn't right. <laughs> yeah. And like the stuff that was going on was like, there were some issues with my pain medication, you know, and they weren't, I was asking for like something stronger than Tylenol and mm-hmm. it wasn't going around to the right doctors. A doctor had like patronized me and said, oh, I'll do it. And then found out he was a psychiatrist. He wasn't, he didn't have jurisdiction to give me pain meds. So like yeah. a little bit of lying, a little bit of games, you know, right. and they also, you know, they were having community meetings and at past hospitals I'd been to, you have community meetings every day. They mm-hmm. had them once a week, once while I was there. And um, I was asking questions. I was very adamant mm-hmm. about, because it was very clear their protocols were kind of, can I curse? Yes, go <laughs> for it, yes. The protocols were bullshit. Like mm-hmm. I started asking questions that were commonplace in other units. Like, are we allowed to touch each other? You know, like mm-hmm. other units are like, you can't physically, you can't high five, you can't do anything. Like no and i asked that question and they were like oh we don't really know like just like nothing inappropriate like yeah. it was, everything was off the fly right and so by that point i started documenting everything dates times names the smallest of instances because i was just like i was like i'm gonna get them mm-hmm. and like it wasn't even bad yet which is so funny that i was like really like serious about like just like, oh, my meds are wrong and like yeah. the chairs are dirty, but like it, it it was crazy. So like like since from the time that you went in there, you kind of knew like this place is just fucked up. Yeah. Basically. But okay. I didn't know to what extent. Because okay. I think there's a difference between just being like, oh, like the hospital is doesn't have the best atmosphere. Right. And like also and then like a, a systemic problem that's yeah. really disenfranchising and hurting vulnerable people right which is what it came to be okay so at that point i'd been there for four days mm-hmm. and been a lot of like patronizing condescending ignorant comments and, like towards like, you towards everyone okay. you know just so like, you noticed it in general 100 percent, 100 percent. even when it wasn't targeted at me um and also just like there were little things you know well big things there the nurse's station which is where you get your meds and you request things or whatever at all other units i'd seen there's no barrier, you know? And I, there, it was cased in glass, mm-hmm. which I think already s- says a lot. You yeah. know, the nurses want safe haven from the patients. So I was like, okay, this is a different ball game. And it became la- like a laughable barrier mm-hmm. to the point people were banging, 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 trying to just get water, toiletries, yeah. tampons, like getting necessities was an undertaking. Um, I saw like a pregnant patient who had diabetes, like ask for Ensure and get denied. They were like, there's nothing. This is a hospital. Right. I like had to give her, like my mom would bring me snacks. I gave her like some Sour Patch Kids or like eventually, which I'll get to, I got put on a one-to-one and like my one-to-one nursing assistant was like the only staff on the unit. It was like 5 a.m. I guess, but mm-hmm. a patient asked, hey, can you take me to the back to get a glass of water, which is like 10 feet away max. And she was like, no, I'm watching her. And I was like, I'll get up and yeah. we'll just walk to get some water. But it was just like that arrogance and that apathy was so, it was palpable in the early right. days. But it didn't really get real until 
day five Mm because that was a saturday and like people have always said it there's nowhere worse to be on a weekend than a psych ward because no one is working there's no doctors not that there really was any actual treatment therapeutic treatment going on in this ward it's a it's a playpen it's a holding cell it's not there's nothing therapeutic about this place but on weekends they don't even pretend like it's you're walking around waiting for the day to be over there's only people on staff or medical assistants you can't like get physicals you know you can't um there's no doctors therapists social workers social workers are the ones who handle your case and get you out you can't get discharged on weekends like it's stifling and quiet and sad yeah (laughs) And on Saturday, I asked the janitors, because I was just, like, really fed up. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to be a martyr, I guess. And so Mm -hmm. I was like, you guys need to – because at this point, there had been, like, piss and period blood and crumbs on, like, our only seating area uh, for, like, as long as I've been there. So I was like, give me, like, a wipe, and I'll do it. (laughs) Because, like – It's gross. It's disgusting. And the genders came in, they were like mocking me. They were like, okay, boss, like, I guess she's like just being patronizing. Mm -hmm. On Saturday, some medical students came to visit and different groups from different colleges to check out the unit, talk to the staff and the patients. I sat down with some of the, with the first group and we had a very, you know, nuanced conversation where I divulged my thoughts about the mental health landscape and it was very peaceful and I was like yeah when I get out of here it's gonna be you know like things need to change it was very peaceful it was very and they were like yeah 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 it was cool and so I was prepared when the second group came in to do the same thing you know I wanted them to know I'm sure they could very well tell but that like you're the future of the medical industry like don't let things be like this you know Mm -hmm. um but that did not end up happening because well earlier that day at lunch I sat down with another patient and I say this and I want to like emphasize that I no means, but I by no means want to demonize the patients at this institution Mm -hmm. because obviously there's circumstances like it's just these were allies more than anything. And he asked to have sex with me. Like we were Mm -hmm. eating lunch and he was like, you want to have sex with me? And I was like, ah, okay. Older men being weird, like used to it, moved on, whatever. Um, But then I, when I was waiting for the second group to come out, I saw him come out of my room, which was a big no-no because the men's and women's units are kept separately. So I was like, and I was the only one who saw it. Like there was staff on the unit, nobody saw it. So I'm looking around, like Mm -hmm. even the students were there. No one's doing anything. No one's reacting. Um, So I go up to this medical assistant and I'm like, hey, you just like walked out of my room. Yeah. (laughs) She's like, who? I'm like, well, he took a sheet. Like, I also don't even want to frame it like it was predatory because I think he really, he was making like a little garment. So he took a sheet off my roommate's bed and like made himself a little thing, whatever. But I still was like, okay, a little uncomfortable. Like, yeah, I wish we could establish, yeah. yeah, like some boundaries mm-hmm. on the unit. Um, The medical assistant, like, patronized me and was just like, ref- they refused to identify him. And I can't stress how ridiculous that is in the sense there was like eight nine men on the unit Mm -hmm. um he was draped in sheets and it's not a large unit and they should be able to recognize everyone on the unit so but they made actually no effort to identify him and i wasn't gonna like point him out for my own safety but i just i was like he's wearing sheets and i was also like you can check the cameras and see this they they didn't like they didn't care this was very scary because this is at the point where i realized like oh this is like bad hospital like they don't care about people where I was like oh like my well-being could like very well be in danger like I'm trying to report like an instance of sexual harassment and they're like well that's really unfortunate right um so I started having a panic attack and I was like trying to plead with her and like this is something I think about often it was like out of a movie I felt like I was in the twilight zone because I was like this is wrong like this isn't okay like do do the right thing. I just kept saying to her, do the right, do the right thing, do the right thing. And she's just like, maybe you should, you know, lie down. Maybe you should like, do you want to get the meds? Like you're the crazy one. Yeah, yeah. like I'm crazy. Mm-hmm. And so I go, I'm like pacing. And there were these two disgusting payphones. Um, and I call the front desk and I'm like, hey, and I can't, and I'm trying to get through. Like obviously, you know, a lot of places, a lot of different 
parts of the hospital will like block the pay phones or whatever because mm-hmm. um, it's from the psych ward but i call the front desk and i'm like hey i'm freaking out um i just got sexually harassed and no one's doing anything and like i can't you know i don't know what to do and she was like are you serious and i was like yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> and she was like you should call the police i was like um okay <laughs> uh i guess that's my option now so i call i call the nine i call 911 from the psych ward phone and doesn't go through. I call again and it gets intercepted. I'm guessing it. I hope it got intercepted because what the operator said was, bitch, you're fucking crazy. You're acting crazy on the cameras. We're going to come down there and sedate you. And I was like, come So to- like when you were trying to call 911, you think the mental hospital was intercepting the call? I think it was the security. Okay. I think they they definitely have set security for the wards. Okay. Um, And I'm guessing... You know, this isn't the first time a psych ward patient has tried to call 911. Right, so, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. So that's what, and that's what they said. Um, come to find out, they were definitely looking at different cameras on a different ward, because mm-hmm. I later found out there were eight of these little tiny units I was on. So they were definitely not talking about me, because I obviously wasn't acting crazy. I was just standing at the phone. Yeah. Um, I don't even want to say acting crazy. I wasn't being volatile. I was yeah. just like shaking and standing. Right. <laughs> And so I was freaking out more because I was like talking. The head nurse is just watching all this happen. Like he he's a character, but he was just like looking at me. And I was like, he says he's going to sedate me. You're not going to let them sedate me. Right. And I'm mm-hmm. freaking out. So at this point, I'm like, wow, like this guy's still like walking around like they're not doing anything. I'm being threatened and like called crazy and a bitch by random people on the phone. Like, I don't I can't get out of here. It's a weekend. My right. social worker doesn't even care. Like this is terrifying you felt stuck i trapped yeah like, yeah and so i started the nursing students were in the the nursing station behind the glass at this point and i just started banging mm. and i was like this isn't right <laughs> this is wrong like are you seeing this this is not how people should be treated and i'm sobbing it was dystopian and everyone just looked at me like behind the glass like this little class and they're like okay maybe it's time to leave and i was like <laughs> Yeah. At that point, I think I was like, you know what? I'll take the pill. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to go to sleep. Um, that's when it really kind of felt serious to me. Also, when I was on the phone and I was like, you're not going to let them sedate me. Like, this is crazy. The head nurse looked at me and he said, you're very sick and you don't have as much insight as you think you do. Which I was like, wow. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> There was the main therapist, Inga, and then <clears throat> this guest therapist. And they were the only two members of the staff who were white. And I bring that up because I felt such a distinction in the way what was happening on the unit was understood by the staff. Like Inga and this guest therapist were terrified constantly. And Inga said to me once, she was like, I told the social worker, you know, that you're more high functioning, not to advocate for your release, but just so they would know. It was all very dog whistle, all very coded, because I was like, what do you mean Mm -hmm. by that? She also, and I asked her, like, I was like, are you okay? Like, in the way that she was, she was just stressed. And she was like, you're too smart to lie to. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Believe it or not, it's, it's not always like this. And I was like, it was clear to me that she was so aware this was unethical treatment mm-hmm. um, of like vulnerable, disenfranchised, mentally ill, majority people of color. And I can tell like, I just got the vibe. She was like, I went to psych school to like make the world a better place. And then she got here and she was like, oh no. <laughs> so how many times was she coming in? Like how many times did you see her there? Was she there every day or? No, she definitely, this happened during the week, um, not the weekend. Like, so you think she, from her coming in, she kind of just saw how people were being treated and stuff like that. And that's why she said that to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause she was well aware and she knew I was aware. Okay. In a way, like other people weren't cognizant of like right. the systemic stuff going on there. I addressed it and I was like, you, and I knew she knew and I could tell yeah. she felt so guilty about it. She was well-meaning, but complicit at the end of the day, which was sad. And um, uh, the other guest therapist was the same way. Just like, I, she brought on mandalas once to have us color in. And I was just like mad as hell. So I was like, can you give us some research mm-hmm. on the backgrounds of mandalas and therapeutic use? And she was like, you know, I can't really 
I'm kind of overwhelmed right now. I can't do that. Like, whatever. <laughs> she was, like, really stressed out. Yeah. Um, but she kind of, like, took it as an excuse to get off the unit. Like, I journaled about it later, and I was like, I feel like she, like, went and, like, took her break to go print the thing, of the research about the monolism therapy. Um, yeah, it was just, it was really interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned those two specifically because I feel like the Black staff, I have a lot of thoughts and theories about, like, why this is so accepted and mm -hmm. okay and like so normal to them like watching the things that continue to happen in this environment happen yeah um and i think it's a majority of the staff were immigrants and my parents are immigrants and like obviously we have different understandings of mental health and i think when you come to america you know you have this understanding like i'm going to make money i'm going to provide for my family going into the metal medical field is you know revered it's hard working and you make good money right and i think seeing majority like people of color black patients on drugs or having mental health crises being inconsolable or not making sense it felt they felt like well we have the same circumstances you know mm -hmm. we look the same but look at me i'm a doctor and you're here yeah it felt like they constantly looked down on us and that showed it, it was present in the treatment like we were less than right obviously that was very potent constantly just that like distinction between like the the white therapists who were like i did this because i cared right. and now i'm complicit in the system i don't agree with and doesn't feel aligned with what i believe in yeah and then the black staff who were more like this is a day job and yeah. at least i'm not you <laughs> right <laughs> but i did have allies on the unit there were three people around my age, three girls on the unit who were around my age. So we we had nothing in common, but we stuck together. So I had a friend. Her name was A, or I'll call her A. Super sweet, super cheery, bubbly. What I understood from talking to her, you know, she'd been in the system for pretty much her whole life. Um, kind of got caught up in psych wards based on like violence. Like she she was in there for homicidal ideation, which was crazy to me or because she was so charming and sweet and mm -hmm. positive um or i guess that's naive but i was it was a great contrast um and understanding her was like eye-opening in a sense it was she was also neurodivergent and she had like trouble with mood regulation and at one point i was like on the phone and i would do like long phone calls with my my, well, my ex. She was sitting on the couch, and I guess something upset her, something triggered her, and she had started having a panic attack, and it was, like, I've had panic attacks before, but it was pretty severe, mm -hmm. and I obviously cared about her, and I was like, we're at a hospital. I hope someone can help her, and they kind of, kind of tackled her, like, kind of two people were on her, and she was screaming and, like, rocking back and forth. And I heard someone come out of the nurse's station and go, what's her name? What room is she in? Which was even more terrifying. Because like I said, there's not many people on this unit. There's not really many rooms. And so I said her name and I was like, that's her room. And someone turned back and goes, oh, baby, they know. And I was like, well, if they knew, they wouldn't have asked. So I was yeah. just like, that was just another instance where I was like, okay, physical safety is like so gray here. Mm -hmm. um because i don't think that's how that should have been handled physically yeah. um and what made it worse was that i started having a panic attack watching that and i'm on the phone like sobbing can't breathe my my ex is trying to like talk me down and be like let's do some deep, deep breathing one two three mm -hmm. and a nurse came up to me and she handed me a paper towel <laughs> and she said you need to stop crying you need to calm yourself down or they're they're gonna hold you here longer you don't belong here so like don't make it look like it mm -hmm. <laughs> which didn't help um, right it's not like the greatest thing to hear in that situation well also it doesn't <laughs> matter i think too it doesn't matter if you belong somewhere or not if you're in an environment where you don't feel safe i think that would make anybody panic you yeah. know what i mean so 100 yeah. percent. i i only bring it up because it was i had been going around adamantly mm -hmm. critiquing and being kind of kind of a bitch to the staff like they knew i think they'd gotten very comfortable going about how they were going about and like taking advantage neglecting and abusing people who 
weren't cognizant of like how it was yeah. happening. I was going to say it's almost like they probably weren't used to someone like you being there with like such sound mind that was like that could pick up on these things to be like this is a problem like this right. is wrong and it needs to be stopped you know and yeah but i don't mean to say it in like a i'm just like so not crazy like i didn't belong there like i just say it because i was like they were so well, you are aware of it which is yeah you know that's and that's okay you know and it's good i think the thing is too is it's it's good that you were aware of it because if it wasn't you, then who would it be? You know what I mean? Like, I feel like stuff like that needs to be brought to light and stopped. And because there's the people in there, are, they're human. You know what I mean? Yeah. And everybody deserves to be treated with respect no matter what state of mind they're in. Right. You know, I mean, like you said, they're there to get help and to feel safe. You know, everybody, it's not prison. Or it yeah. shouldn't be like prison. It you shouldn't know? be like prison. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I also do want to emphasize, I don't feel other I don't feel like I'm not like them. Like, right. we were all in the same psych, mm -hmm. you know? We were all getting treated for mental health. Yeah. And it's like, I think that's the baseline. Right. So, like, I felt like the differentiation kind of said something. Like, they were, they were, there was subtext there. Well, you know? to correct me if I'm wrong, but when you go into the psych ward, you can't, like, pick and choose. Mm -mm. Right, right. So, it's like people that might be dealing with all different types of right. things, they're all going to be in the same unit, mm -hmm. right? Okay. 100%. So, on the unit, there was another woman and calling her s s had been on the unit the longest to the point that i once had her heard her call at home she had a single the easiest way to explain it is that like s was like the big bad of the unit or at least perceived that way like she would just walk in well i mean there's not much else to do but walk in circles but like walk in circles and like often like talk to herself and when there were physical altercations, she was usually involved to the point, you know, people were obviously cruel to her, um, but like she didn't really notice. Like there was just, there wasn't much cognizance. Mm -hmm. She was just here and this was home. And people really villainized her, demonized her. And like, I had my instances where it like, it sounds bad. Like she'd come up to me and say whatever she'd say. But like eventually, actually very quickly, I realized she's never, like talking to you yeah she's never attacking you mm -hmm. like, like not to take it personally no like she's yeah she doesn't know right <laughs> she, like she would she's just honestly like i always felt like she was just saying things that were said to her mm -hmm. you know and like making connections and like i just didn't say anything and she she would leave me alone um and eventually like it started to anger me the way that people didn't realize that. Yeah. Like, people were so scared of her. Like, people were so like, oh, like, I don't, it was so weird because I was like, she, she doesn't really know what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. And her and A, like, would get in, they were the ones that had the most physical altercations. They fought a lot. And um, A, he beat her ass and it was like 19 and like 5 3 like it mm. was everyone was acted so shocked like how did a must be so strong but it was like it's not you know it was never we need to use critical thought like right. it was not whatever um i guess we never really had a conversation but i honestly felt really like aligned and seen with her by because like she was be in the common rooms and like talking to herself and you pick up on like things she was saying and, you know, it, I kind of got, like, her backstory from that. And I was, like, and she was also, like, a black woman. And she was queer. I'm queer. And I felt paralleled and, like, sad to see how demonized she was. Because she, I think I heard legally you can only get the needle, like, be sedated, like, every nine hours. And they really put that to work on her. Like, she was the exclusive resident of the seclusion room, which is something you see in horror movies and nightmares just strapped down room also something i'd never really seen on other units like to yeah. that degree there were private rooms you know for people that are going through whatever but like the straps um yeah not to say like i'm sure i don't know <laughs> there was no effort ever ever to treat s it was managing s this was holding cell this was mm -hmm. Well, there's nowhere else to put her like <laughs> and so we sedate her as much as we can and we tie her up as much as we can and when we can't we all deal with it and ignore her i guess i'm going back but after i'd reported um that i got sexually harassed 
when I took the pill, I woke up. I was like, I want to speak to somebody higher. I want to talk to somebody higher. This doctor comes down. Mm. <laughs> and I go off. I'm like, the, ch- the chairs haven't been clean. You know, you're, this is da-da-da-da-da, da 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 And the students are still there at this point, watching from the door. She just stands there, coldly looks at me, and just goes, we're going to put you on a one-to-one. And what exactly does that mean? It means... You're going to, there's going to be eyes on you 24 seven and your door is going to stay open. Okay. Which I was upset about one because it kind of punished my roommate and she didn't do anything. And two, I felt like I was being punished for getting sexually harassed. I was like, why can't he be put on a one-to-one? Oh, right. because you didn't identify him. Right. And it, I just kept saying whatever. And she was just like, you're being put on a one-to-one. Your door will stay open. Da, 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 da. Like just didn't, didn't care. Didn't want to hear it. And the students were watching this and she turns around to go. And she goes to the students and says, oh, you guys sure you want to be doctors? And I just think it was as horrible as of a thing as that to say. I think it really does solidify the fact that they know this is unacceptable. Yeah. And she was trying to pander to the students to be like, oh, you know, day in the life of a doctor. Right. Like, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Good doctors. Well, also, it's, besides that, it's, it's extremely unprofessional. Yeah, to right. Say that. Like, it doesn't even matter. Like, even if that's a thought that you have, you don't say that in front of. Like, right in front of me, in yeah. front of the students, like, in my right. doorway. I was like, wow, okay. But also great. that, unfortunately, seeing somebody that is higher up like that and older say something like that to younger students that are almost looking up to that position, that might make them feel like, oh, like, that's okay for us to say. Or, you know what I mean? That's okay for us to treat someone like that. Right. So, unfortunately, it's like trickles down. It trickles down. Yeah. And now a word from our sponsor. Our sponsor for today's episode is Athletic Greens. I personally love AG1 for so many reasons, and the list goes on and on. First off, if I ever wake up and I'm just feeling really tired, foggy, and just not mentally clear – AG1 is the first thing that I start my day with. I head downstairs, I take a scoop of AG1, mix it with some water, and I am good to go. I'm ready for the gym, I'm ready to start my day. Whatever the day has coming to me, I'm prepared for it because of AG1. Over the years, it has always been extremely difficult for me to find the proper supplements for my body, and since adding AG1 into my morning routine, that is no longer something that I have to worry about because of all the added vitamins and minerals that you get with just one scoop. Another reason why I love AG1 is because along with all of its amazing benefits, you can also enjoy the taste as well. I always make sure never to miss a morning of AG1 because I know that without it, I am not gonna be as mentally clear and I'm definitely not going to have the energy boost that it always gives me. So that being said, if you are looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D along with five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash insane. That is athleticgreens.com slash insane. Check it out. The one-to-one was a whole situation in itself, though. Like, it was ridiculous. And that's it goes back to my whole thing about I don't think there's any real protocols here. Everyone's just, like, saying whatever. Um, I woke up at, like, 5 a.m. because – and they would switch the one-to-ones out, like, every three hours or so. Um, I woke up at 5 a.m. because my one-to-one was playing bubble pop on her phone outside her door. Uh-huh. And I was like, are you playing bubble pop? She was like, no. And I was like, are you even – then I started to look into are you even allowed to have phones? Because right. one thing I was like – I was considering like legal action against the hospital at this point. And I don't really, I've tried, I don't really have a case, like especially, I know, I'll get into how commonplace this is, but like, I was like, what are the protocols? Like, are there rules being broken here? Right. Um, and all that the first doctor had said was like, door stays open 24 seven, right? So I'm like, is our phones even allowed? Um, and I, the next day, different one-to-one, he, with his entire chest. Like, at least the the last one to one, like, you know, she was like, no, I'm not, like, playing bubble pop yeah. at 5 a.m. outside your door. He started watching soccer on his phone, like, not trying to hide it. People, wa- other staff members walked by and, like, said hi. Like, watch, like, no one cared. And yeah. with no headphones, my roommate's trying to sleep, fully just watching soccer. And that's when I just, like, kind of got really pissed off. Because yeah. I was like, this is obnoxious and disrespectful to, like, my roommate and also, like, you're, this is a job. I was going to say, you're yeah. at work. So. You're at work. Yeah. Everyone's fine with this. So I was like, no. I know the two rules, right? 24-7, all I, and door stays open, right? So I, I waited for them to switch 
for to switch one to ones. And you know, they're chopping it up. They're like, oh my god, hi. They don't obviously eyes aren't on me. Eyes were very rarely on me. 24-7 is laughable. But um he gets up and I run into my bathroom, which has no door, by the way. Like psych ward bathrooms are not like it's a psych ward. Yeah. The, the architecture is aware of that. It's not easy to hide in the bathroom. But there was probably one foot, no, maybe 10 inches of like paneling a line along the line of the toilet right and i squeezed in and i stood there and at this point i developed a tremor because i wasn't sleeping and i was constantly scared so i'm like shaking by this wall <laughs> like obviously this is ridiculous i'm like this isn't gonna work but it did work because <laughs> he lost me and there's no way um like literally there's no way to get out of my room without someone seeing you you're just back on the unit everyone yeah. would see you so everyone's like where did she go right where did she go it took four MAs, nurses, staff, walked through the room several times. No one thought to walk into the bathroom because who would want to? They're absolutely disgusting. But like, just, I was gone for four minutes, like yeah. just shaking behind a wall because no one thought to step one foot into mm -hmm. the bathroom. Um, eventually the head nurse, and me and him were like adversaries. I kind of see him as like my Mr. Mosby at this point. Like, it's almost funny. But he comes in and he sees me and I just like, I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. it was, that was kind of my, my grasp at power at this point. Cause yeah. I was like, I feel so, my autonomy, my autonomy feels non-existent. And I was like, if I can get the paperwork for the protocol, this will, whatever, whatever. And you know, nothing came of it, but it did, it was funny. And I just think it does go to show like a tangible example of them not caring. Yeah. They're and, just like very unaware. Yeah. And there being repercussions of it. But also, like, where could I have gone? Like, there, right. it was kind of ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> it got to the point, still on the one-to-one, -one, uh, where I realized no one knew why I was on the one-to-one. -one, and aside from the guy with the sheets, there had been another guy who, you know, he would wait outside my door and, like, try to bring me gifts and stuff, like Chipotle, like Fanta Soda. Um, and, you know, he was chill. He kind of had, like a, like, a nice boy crush on me, but he was, like, double my age. I was like, and I'm also gay, so I was like, oh, no. But um, I did want him to, like, stop pacing outside my room because um, my roommate didn't like it, obviously. Mm -hmm. And but also they didn't make no effort to, like, make note of this, identify yeah. either of these. Men, so they had no idea. So it'd be points where my one to one was like standing outside my door, like twiddling her thumbs and he would still be like pacing outside my room or like my one to one would like go to the bathroom, which I don't even know what the protocol is supposed to be for that. And he would like that would be when he would approach me. And like it was like why are you even here like this yeah. is just we're just saving face like because right. when you don't have the context for the for the one-to-one -one, what do you, what are we looking for well i feel like it's it's pretty obvious that any red flag that would that you felt uncomfortable with they either just didn't see or they didn't care mm -hmm. and it's like even if you would have brought it up would it have made a difference probably not yeah. you know like i just i think that it seems like all of the patients were extremely unheard, which I think is really unfair because, like I said before, everybody deserves to feel safe, um, you know, and, and everybody's going through their own their own thing in there. You know what I mean? But I feel like if, if somebody brings something up of feeling uncomfortable, the staff should listen, but also the staff should be aware themselves. Yeah. It came to the point where, like, okay, they don't care about our physical safety. You know, they don't care about protocols. But, like... And I mean, even with the paper towel incident when I was crying, like they don't really care about therapy, but there was a point where, you know, S was having a moment, which triggered A, cause they beefed and A like came in and was like, I'm seeing red and I don't know what to do. Can you help me? And like all the staff are dealing with the S incident. It's just us in the room. I'm 20 <laughs> and I just like, I talked her through some like one, two, three breathing exercises. And she was like, thank you. You just saved my life. Like it was, but it was terrifying because it was like, this is a hospital. Like how come there's no one? Like, why is it that another patient yeah, is having to help? Having right? to talk someone down. And like, why is there no staff in this room with us? Like also like what happened to the one-to-one? -one? Just saying. But right. like, it's yeah. like, it was just situations like that were constant where it was just like, the bandwidth was being stretched in terms of like, how much I could personally withstand and also like 
genuinely feeling scared and caring about people around me getting hurt because it was just like no one cared enough to do anything in any capacity, you know, yeah. other than like print pictures of mandalas, you know. <laughs> but so, yeah, by Monday, things were back in swing. The staff was back. The doctors were back. Um, so it's not to interrupt you, but it's different staffing during the week and then the weekends. Yeah, the weekend is just pretty much anyone who will show up. Okay. That's why you were saying like things just aren't taken as seriously because you think that there's a big difference in like the no, type of staff. No, they're, they're, it's never taken seriously. Okay. But especially on but the weekend on the because weekends. like they're just being paid to essentially babysit. Got it. Whereas like the doctors and the psychiatrists have to like not and pretend, but like also okay. don't do anything. Got it. Um, <clears throat> But by day seven, it I guess word had kind of gotten around that like... I was taking notes <laughs> and like I heard like some nurses whispering like, oh, that's her, whatever. Or like when I woke up, my meds were like promptly sent, like given to me because there'd been issues with that. And I was like unhappy. And like, I guess um, I journal about this too. Like, I guess S came up to me, said some stuff, whatever. Like it really didn't bother me. Like I didn't, I was not threatened or upset by her. Like I felt, I understood what was going on. And um, the head nurse Mr. Mosby, he was like, he brought me into a private room and he was like, I'm so sorry. You know, she does that to literally everyone. I'm so sorry about the harassment. And I was like, it was just so clear. He didn't understand what I was upset about because right. yeah. <laughs> I was like, I, first of all, I've been here for a week. Like, I understand this has happened to me before. And right. the fact that you're pulling me, pulling me specifically out now is is pathetic yeah. like you're clearly trying to perform something or like act like you're good at your job right now um and also completely misunderstanding like my problem is with this institution and the way that you guys honestly treat her and the fact that like you're trying to flip it as if i'm like oh, i just uh oh, people here like right. this is that has never been the situation so mm -hmm. it only made me more upset and i was like why so did you explain to him like what? Yes. You're actually, okay. Yes, I did. And what was his response to that? He just left. Like he didn't, he wasn't. Like he didn't really acknowledge it? He just nodded. Like he was okay. trying to be agreeable at this point because right. I don't know, like maybe, because I did have a couple like schemes. I had the one-to-one -one scheme and then they also had it. I was counting the hours and being a little um, willfully avoidant about having my bandages changed, but like how could I live on a psych ward? Like they could have just come to my room, but like they didn't, I was trying to get to a point where um, they hadn't been changed for long enough that it could be malpractice essentially. Okay. Um, which it went like 60 hours, but, <laughs> um, and I guess maybe, I don't know if they knew, like caught on whatever, but, or just like knew I was taking notes, didn't want to whatever, whatever. But that night, so this was like my last 30 hours. Things got very real in the last 30 hours. Um, so, I guess, I guess SNA kind of came to a head. Like, I can't even express, like, I don't think they really disliked anything about each other. I think they both just felt threatened. Um, but S had turned, like, a comb into, like, a shiv and was, like, told me while we were, like, sitting watching the office on Freeform and was, like, if she, like, comes to me again, I'm going to slit her throat. And I was, like, no, don't do that. I told the one-to-one -one, because I was like, okay, I don't think that's going to happen. But like the fact there's a a weapon and intent, like let's just avoid it. Did you see the weapon? Like, did yeah. you see her? Okay. Yeah. And I mean, the staff saw it too. Like she right. was using it to comb hair, but also it was a shiv. Um, and I told my one-to-one -one, and she was like, oh, okay. And I was like, like, why wouldn't they take it away? Right. Right. And like, this wasn't even the first note of contraband. Like someone had snuck nail clippers in. Like it yeah. was, they didn't, yeah. So my one-to-one -one didn't do anything. They switched. And then I was like, maybe she's going to tell the next person. And then I saw A go up to like her favorite medical nurse and just be like, and tell her the same thing. Tell her exactly the same thing. I hate her. I'm going to slit her throat with this shiv that I made. They never they took told it. a doctor that? Yeah. And Stop. they didn't do anything? They didn't do anything. No, she's started brushing people she was giving someone bantu knots like it was really like yeah yeah the next day was my my last day i woke up really early but i was leaving at 12 so i woke up at 7 and i saw i kind of saw like how this whole thing played out it was so like genuinely cinematic like 
S was in a good mood. S was giving people high fives, like sitting on the ground, like just chopping it up, talking and like, like to herself, but you know, like vibrantly, like happy. It was chill. Um, we even, I think we even got some like outside time that day, which means like standing on the concrete little garden in the circle, which was great. Cause like hadn't felt sun yeah. <laughs> in like a week. A medical assistant was watching us. I, all I know is I woke up at seven and it was chill for like an hour, two hours. And I went to, I think we had quote music therapy, which is just like, here, you get to play one song, um, <laughs> which was fun. And I got back from that, got back, like I walked across the room. I just know a fight broke out. I just mean S and A. No, between S and the medical assistant. Got it. And it was unlike anything I've ever seen. Utter chaos. Because the medical assistant was fighting back. Like it wasn't like defense. It wasn't it didn't give self defense to me. And it also didn't give like trying to talk this like psych ward patient down. Like she was angry. Like they were fighting. And like the medical assistant had to be pulled off of her, like by under her arms with like screaming and kicking there's like blood on her face like they really got into it like a scrap um everyone came out of their rooms people were coming off from like different units to like remedy the situation they were like everybody go to your rooms it was so clear they didn't know how to handle this which is crazy because stuff like this happens actually every day but like this one was a big one because the medical assistant was involved in like blood and like you know had to be pulled off it was insane and Every, like and also like everyone they're like go to your rooms i literally stood there because i was like what do you mean go to my room like yeah. you guys <laughs> they didn't have control of anything anyway exactly yeah. the head nurse pulls me and i'm not supposed to leave for like an hour he pulls me he's like you know sign your paperwork we're getting like in a rush in a panic because mm-hmm. i guess he's like he doesn't want me to see this but i'm like come on you know mm-hmm. i've been here um and he gets me out and i'm and i'm out in the middle of that i think as i was the last thing i saw was like they were trying to lure s across the room um to sedate her like while she was walking it was like literally insanity everyone's just standing there like the nursing assistant like i think she's still trying to be talked down in the back room it was absolutely insane people like yeah and i i get through those double doors i see sun for the first time there's my mom my mom had also visited me like shout out to my mom she visited me every day um mm-hmm. i didn't eat any of the meals that the, that hospital gave me Ew. uh she brought me meals every day and Were you telling your mom what was going on oh she knew everything yeah. yeah like my the only way i got through this was like my mom and like my ex at the time yeah. but like that kind of blew up but right. um and like yeah she knew that she was with me with the legal action like she was with me with the bandage thing with the one-to-one like that was my rock right. um in terms of physical safety and we, we were both just like you need to get out of there so you were there for a total of seven days yeah okay and was yeah. that the last time that you were in yes in to- okay yes it was yeah i got out <laughs> so that stay obviously didn't did, like i'm sure it didn't really help you mentally no okay. did not. definitely it was made just, it worse like, yeah it was just like an experience i feel like for you that you saw unfortunately how negligent places like that can be yeah for sure and like kind of what happened after is that i so i, I got out and i was like angry mm-hmm. <laughs> i was like this needs to change i and i kind of i really did neglect like because i had already gone in there with stuff so i ne- kind of neglected my own like this became my life like right. i started this petition i was like posting you know doing research reporting what holds it every mental health justice department in new york city and it was kind of going nowhere and it was driving me crazy and it was so hard and i also needed to find a different place to get treatment Mm -hmm. which was really difficult for some reason i had to like i ended up going all the way to i went to arizona to like this residential treatment center for like a month which was nice you know it's like a like but it's not accessible it's like a bougie place i got a scholarship to go um and and I only honestly went because my therapist gave me an ultimatum because she was like, if you don't like get treatment, um, I can't see you anymore. So I did that. Also, do you want to mention, um, I did in my research phase, in my petition, find out a lot of terrible stuff about Woodhull. I think four people have died there, not even in the psych that's, unit. That's in the past. where you were. Huh? That's the mental hospital that you were in? Woodhull, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, four people have died at Woodhull Hospital in like the past four years, um, not even in the psych unit just like the whole hospital it's a systemic thing it's a public hospital um but i found the craziest thing in my research which was an article called seven and a half days by kevin feldman 
journalistic piece written in 1998, he willingly got himself admitted to Woodhull to write a piece, make a statement about how mental health is treated in like low income neighborhoods. Yeah. And his experience 20 plus years ago was glaringly similar to mine. I'd say the only difference is that we didn't get smoke breaks okay. and they did. Yeah. <laughs> um, so basically this has been a problem for... This has been a problem. Okay. Um, and as much as I heard, you know, other people reach out after the petition and be like, I went to this one in Queens. I went to this one in the East Village and similar terrible stuff happened to me. I was like, this is... This hospital has been on this for 20 years yeah. um, and it's terrifying um, how nothing has changed. Right. They have a lot of blood on their hands and just the whole hospital, like the whole, all the departments. Yeah. And I think the issue too is not only obviously what's happening there and, and the negligence there, but the fact that you went there to get help too and like you weren't even able to receive that. Yeah. You know, like your main focus, if anything, was just getting out of there safe which is unfortunate because, yeah. you know, it's just that was a waste of time for you. And on top of it, you experienced, you know, you were in an environment where you didn't feel safety. And that's, sh- you know, it's just it's really unfortunate that there are places like that. And, that, and the thing is, too, is like that's not the only one. You know yeah, what I mean? Like There's all. so many places like that. And that's why I think it is so important for you to share your story and talk about it, because I'm sure there's other people that have been you know, in mental hospitals that feel like, well, I I was going to say too, I feel like it's one of those things that people might just think, well, this is just how it is. You know what I mean? But it shouldn't be that way. Because like we said earlier, it isn't a prison. You know what I mean? It's supposed to be a place that no matter what state of mind you're in, you deserve to get the help that you want to get and that you're seeking to get. Exactly. And I also would like want to add on to that, that this isn't just how it is. Right. Like I've been to other units in demographically different areas and it is nothing remotely similar similar to this in terms of cleanliness quality of care attentiveness food like yeah. it's just like it's ridiculous and like for for a city as highly populated highly funded as new york city and now like with eric adams like eric adams is now trying to do like a thing where police can like take people that are perceived to be mentally ill and just like put them in the psych wards and i'm like well maybe we should start with the hospitals then <laughs> like if yeah. you want you know like there's no recognition of or uh, i guess like a discussion about how racialized and like classist it is because it's just like it's not like this everywhere right. and it's especially shouldn't be like this in new york yeah. you know like such a highly di- uh, diverse city right and i really really want to touch on like the repercussions of of this being my life i guess of this having happened to me because it's like yeah this is a bad hospital you know negligence is sad (laughs) negligence boo but like what really darkened this experience and i think is most palpable and that i want to push to like as many people as possible is that like what was worst about this was like how the people in my life treated me afterwards i obviously was a shell of myself um i didn't like trust mental health institutions i didn't trust i i couldn't i didn't feel safe anywhere yeah. um and like my only safe havens were like my mom and like my ex who had really been there for me and we were exes at the time we weren't together but like they had really been there for me throughout this they visited me you know they called me when i like it was real um but it got to a point where, like, I, I guess I just trusted them more than I trusted myself. Mm-hmm. And it was really rough. They became the know-all be-all to my mental health and straight up told me they thought I had BPD, um, which is a really stigmatized disorder. Our, our dynamic got really toxic and upsetting. And, you know, I was clearly very much in a bad place and still not treated and not better. I didn't have, you know the same cognizance I'd once had. And I think they saw that and thought that they, you know, could save me and then couldn't. And then I had no one, right? So I'd just gone through this and my ex was like, you're too sick and I don't want you. (laughs) And call your friends. Did you have a good friend group at this point or? At this point, I think they all trusted them more than they trusted me. Like, okay. Especially with the idea that I, I had BPD. Um, and so you I didn't just really got, have a, a good like, solid support I group. didn't have a support system. Okay. And they all like went to them for information about me. 
And it got to a point where I had no idea what was going on. No one was yeah. talking to me. This podcast is my first time like telling the story in full. Okay. Like no one really asked. Like right. there wasn't support at all yeah. from those people I thought I could trust. And um, eventually like it all blew up and a rumor got around that I was like, <laughs> like my ex basically told people I was a drug addict okay. and it was believable because of mental health stigma i just been in the psych ward i just went to yeah. residential and um was this after you went to arizona after okay yeah well they sent a like a long text to my mom yeah. being like drug addict and my mom came to pick me up i was like mom how could you believe them over me and they were like she was like i don't <laughs> i think that you can't trust any of these people and you need to get out of here mm -hmm. and that was kind of the turning point in my recovery um i had to go home you back know, to new jersey yeah okay moved out of my apartment in silence because the roomies you know didn't yeah. know what to say and like i bring it up because i feel like not everyone listening is like a doctor in the mental health field but like a lot of people have friends who have mental health issues um and it's hard and i've been on the other side of it but i guess i just want to like advocate for compassion and absolutely and patience because on the drive home after the whole drug addict situation, which was which was crazy. Because I had just gotten back from residential. Like, I'd been screened. Mm -hmm. And, like, there was no evidence or at all for a substance abuse issue. But um, it was just stigma. On the drive back, I, like, sent everyone a text. And I was like, guys, I don't know what's going on. Like, you mm -hmm. know, like, please don't talk to them about what's going on with me over me. Like, da-da-da-da. And I, like, never heard from any of those people again. Like, that was it. Well, I think, too, like, it's difficult because if you feel like you don't have a good support system, like, I feel like that has to come from somewhere. And I know that you had your mom, but at that age, when you are in your 20s, like, you should be able to lean on friends and you should, you know, and, and friends should be there for that. And I agree with you that there is a huge stigma around mental health and not enough people care enough. Like, if I feel like a lot of people, the way that people's brains work is if it's not happening to them why deal with it themselves? You know what I mean? Like it's easier for people to judge. It's easier for people to like just throw their hands in the air and be like, oh, I can't deal with that or with their issues. But what I think a lot of people don't realize and I think too like what you are kind of saying is what you want to emphasize on is the fact that like if you have friends that are going through something, the importance of being there for them, you know, like here, even if even if you can't directly relate, but just listening and making someone feel heard and like they have a support system can make the biggest difference because I feel like if you had that you would feel a lot better everyone's going through their own mental health journey and like obviously the spectrum of that can vary a lot it could be something more like you know mild or it could be something more severe but no matter where you lie on that on that spectrum it's like everyone deserves a support system and everyone deserves to be heard and it's like it doesn't matter what you're going through like the people in your lives should really be there and understand that and if they're not then they are yeah. sorry pieces of shit you know what i mean like but you know what i'm saying like it's like if people yeah. if if you see somebody's going through something and your response is to diagnose them with something or assume that they were on drugs or whatever else that says more about them than it does about you you know what i mean and it's it's really unfortunate that that would be I mean, people are people are evil you know what i mean and that's people's response when they don't know how to deal with something and they just want to judge and assume and it makes them feel better because they have issues too so that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like I just feel like that's, that's kind of like, that's maybe more of a blunt way of saying it. No, but, but I just I, feel yeah. like, you know, it's it's really important for people to be there for others. Even if like you're not a direct friend, but like if you know somebody that's going through something, just to let them know like, hey, look, I'm here for you. I might not get what you're going through, but like I'm here if you need it, you know, kind no. of thing. That's what I think. But not enough people are like that, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, another issue is that they really, like, wanted to front that they were. Like, I guess no one honestly ever said, like, we're here for you. Call me if you need to talk. Yeah. But, like, they, it was implied. Like, we knew each other well. We'd known each other for right. years. And, like, I, you know, they would text me, like, hope you're well. But it was never, like, it really never was that do you want to talk. Like, right. they, like, knew what had happened. and knew, Or they knew what had happened through the words of my ex. And, like, no one ever brought it up to me and asked how I felt about it. I just had to kind of struggle by alone and, like, put on a face and it was hardest because it felt like an extension of the hospital in a lot of ways. I was like, I felt so gaslit and crazy in the hospital for being the only one who really was like 
calling out what was going on there yeah, and noticing what was and happening noticing what was happening and then i left and i was like why is everyone being so weird to me like it, yeah. it made me feel gaslit and crazy again because i was like why is everyone saying like we love you like let's do something and like when i need something when i cry like when i'm like even the, the littlest bit upset it's like it's untouchable it's right. it's gross yeah. it's we can't get into it we have you know and i was like i lived lot, with these yeah. people people are like that too like yeah. i've noticed just in, in life in general it's like people whenever you release emotion or show emotion it's like if people aren't capable of like feeling that having compassion, compassion. like that's like a big word like if people aren't capable of that they're just gonna like cut off like because it's easier for people to do you know which yeah. it sucks but i feel like that's what a lot of people do i really even wish like because i do i guess there's nuance and i respect the ideas around like sometimes you can't carry something for someone else okay and i don't think i was asking anyone to carry anything for me whatsoever but like in general it's that i think there's nuance in terms of how much one can take on but i think that i wish someone would have said that to me yeah. i don't think that was the case for any of them i think they're just kind of apathetic and non-confrontational right. but like i wish i could have sent that text and had someone say honestly like we can't be there for you right now or like you know, I'm going through something or just even anything, but yeah. they never said anything to me. Like I never, like there was never closure. It was just like, we know what you went through. Right. You know, we never talked to you about it, but like it yeah. was just like, like this is off. just, and yeah. then I was gone. And and then I was So gone. you don't talk to any of these people anymore? No. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. Better <laughs> off not in your life anyway. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, too, back to the mental hospital experience that you had, like I said, obviously as shitty and unfortunate as it was it's good that you're coming on here and talking about it because it is something that's very real and that happens there's always good and there's always bad with things you know what I mean and, and it's it's interesting too that you experience like you had good experiences in good hospitals and it's the thing is too maybe if you didn't have that mm -hmm. and your first experience was the one in New York it was right that was the bad one like you might not you might think that that was normal right. so it's like it's important I think that you had both experiences to be like this is not normal and I have seen what, like, how people should be treated. Right. And, you know, because a lot, like I said, a lot of people might not realize that. They might just kind of think, like, oh, well, I guess this is what happens when you go to a psych ward or when you go into a mental hospital. But it shouldn't be that way. You know, nobody should be abused in whatever way that might be, you know. Exactly. And I think, too, some people might not think that having your environment be dirty or having your concerns be like just neglected and not listened to that still is a form of abuse because yeah. you know you're in there basically relying on the staff and the doctors to take care of you you know and they're if they're just not then that's abuse and it's it's screwed up thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and i'm sure that there will be a lot of people that can either relate to it or like i said Maybe they've experienced it, you know, and they didn't know any different. So I think it's amazing and great job. You did great. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. <laughs>